you have you have an impact every single one of you here today and in fact every single one of us on this planet every day we exist we have an impact and we many of us spend a lot of our lives looking for how to have an impact and how to help the world and we're spending all this time looking for ways to do that out out there and we're missing that it's happening right in front of us with our own families so with that being said taking a moment to take stock of where we are in the world um, we've heard about the new normal we hear about it on the news and we know that with um, all the world's um, news impacting us uh, normal has changed and the reality is we don't get to go back we're not going back to where we came from and so now we have to look forward. And with that, um, I wanna make sure that as we move forward, we're thinking about our impact today. And I really am hoping that uh, when, when you have 20 minutes to, uh, with a captive audience, the, the pressure to say something really important for those people is there. And so what I wanna um, really bring it around to is you have an impact every single day. Your children, your family, everybody that you interact with, they are growing every single day. And so with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and start um, just the, the little presentation here and uh, we'll get going. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about my one foot world. So this might look pretty familiar how we have in the last three months as a collective nation started to try to struggle to experience what education is when we don't have um our, our kids aren't able to go to school and what i see here is this very unique opportunity to stop and rethink what learning is and what learning could be and when i heard rebecca's presentation about kids and screen time my fear is that parents, they're left with little support right now. We have this structure where we've been sending our kids to school where they have one adult and 30 children and they're supposed to sit there and absorb all this learning. And what is learning and, and what should our kids be learning? Now, I understand that it's important that I acknowledge when I moved into my new role here in Alaska about a year ago as education director for the Canadian Indian tribe, I realized that I had to make a move from being a professional educator who carried out the will of the system to having to take a stance about what I really believe education could and should be. And so with that, I look at this, this world, this one foot world that we have all these kids honing in on, and this is this tiny little world and that's what they get. And, and all they do is they move their fingers. They don't even handwrite or draw or color anymore. Their world is this passive, light coming into their eyes and somehow that's supposed to be learning and so with that being said i'm going to share with you a little bit about my one foot world so <clears throat> life is full of obstacles some are fun some are unpleasant uh some are downright um horrid and every obstacle is an opportunity to find weakness and get better constant improvement is something i believe we need to impart with our children always seeking to learn Sometimes the obstacle is you. you can go over it, go under it, go through it. You could skip obstacles. Sometimes the obstacle is knowing when to quit or when to fight through for a friend when you should have quit sooner. So my sport, <laughs> um, I am not an athlete. I do a lot of athletic things, but I've always been near last or last at pretty much everything I participate in. So to frame for you, I am a participant of obstacle course races I don't race, okay? So obstacle course racing didn't exist 10 years ago, but I have always um, taken on any activity that I can, any new sport, any new activity, and tried it out And because I'm a learner and I love learning. That is what I think we need to impart on our children, love of learning. So I've done dozens of obstacle course races. Um, everyone is an opportunity to learn something different, and sometimes it's knowing when to stop. So uh, obviously some, some races are a little bit more muddy than others and some require a lot more um, uh, grit, all right? So really truly part of why I do obstacle course racing is for the people, the community. I've never found a community like I have with obstacle course racing because it is about helping everybody be successful. So here we are. 
Uh, this is just a little moment here I had with a friend. Now this race wasn't a big obstacle course race. There were, it was a women's only race. And at this moment uh, at the top of this fire pole, and this is one of my best friends, Jess, and she and I are um, about to count to three and go down the fire pole and take a risk. And so uh, the way that everybody cheers for you and, and rallies you on is uh, really pretty incredible. So I love doing races with novice racers. If you, if you can walk a 5K, I can take you on a race, all right? And you'll find stuff about you that you didn't know. Each of the challenges, um, they, they take ingenuity, they take innovation, and they take a way to really think differently and problem solve. And the reality is, is that unless you're an elite racer, it, it, it's all about you. It, it's not about um, you know, finishing strong, it's about finishing safely. I mean, it could be about finishing strong, but so often, um, I, even before I got into obstacle course racing, um, I didn't want to try it because I thought I would fail. I, I almost didn't even do a 5k 10 years ago because I thought that I wouldn't be able to finish it. And so what it is, is going and trying it and finding out what your gaps and your weaknesses are. So, I signed up for America's Toughest Mudder. I believe this was 2016 or 2017. And America's Toughest Mudder is a little bit different than other Tough Mudder races. I've never actually done a Tough Mudder. And um, the obstacles are much, much bigger than all the other <laughs> races I've ever done. And so um, this race that I did, it was actually, um, it, start, it was a midnight start through the middle of the night. And um, when I got there, uh, one of the first things I saw, I remember it's like 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night was this, it didn't look like this, it was in the dark. And this is the last obstacle of that race. Now, whew, um, that drop from the top of those rings to the air pad below, for me, was the absolute most terrifying thing that I could encounter on this race. And I knew it'd be the last one. And so when I got there, or when I got to the race, it was the first thing I saw, I was ready to be done and I was ready to quit. So, um, I did, I felt very small and very scared. And I really was like, how am I going to do that one obstacle at the end of the race? There are 400 elite racers in this and I did not feel like I belonged at all. So <clears throat> the goal was to do as many laps as I could in eight hours, two laps of five miles each, uh, approximately 30 obstacles um, at a minimum to complete the race. I just wanted to finish safely. Um, I, I did have a couple injuries. I'm not gonna really talk about that. Uh, one thing that was really um, unnerving about this particular race in the dark that I didn't anticipate is that uh, CBS was filming and they had drones flying over the race the entire time. And being somebody who's very camera shy, I was mortified at the drone that followed me over the whole first, um, you know, few feet of the race in the dark with my headlamp on. So my headlamp um, it was um, it was waterproof headlamp, and in the dark, I had about a one foot circle shining down on my feet for this entire race. So as we're thinking about where we are with um, the world right now, thinking about this one foot world, all I could see, I knew that Kong, that, that obstacle was there. I knew about all these other obstacles, but there I was, and um, all I could see is this one foot world, and I could barely even step forward without the risk of um, rolling an ankle. All right, so uh, this was an update in the middle of the race. This was not the finish, this was the end of the first lap. Um, I found a friend, we helped each other through uh, several very difficult obstacles. And uh, there we were, 2.45 a.m. So, I'm gonna just skip a couple things here. Um, there are some really, really horrible obstacles on this race, I'm gonna tell you, one of which involves going down these tubes here. Um, I don't know if you guys can see my, my mouse, but the, the tubes there, um, you go down and then you go into a big giant tub of water where they put ice all day long in it, and you have to go underneath this ice water. And I'll tell you, uh, any discomfort, I would rather um, do lots of horrible things over having to do this particular one again. The moment in this race uh, where I felt the most responsibility to other people around me was the ridge line. It wasn't an obstacle per se, but this was at a motocross track in Los Angeles and it was straight up, up a hill. So it was 40 degrees, um, colder than they said it would get, we're soaking wet, and 
uh, the winds kicked in 40 to 50 miles an hour. And as we started going up, um, I had my husband in front of me and in front of him was a whole line of other people. And behind me stacked up a whole line of other people. And the pressure that I felt, this narrow ridge line had a single file trail that was rutted out and I barely could keep going. I was so tired. And what changed for me in that moment is that all I could see was this one foot world, this one foot circle of light. I knew I had all these other obstacles to get ready for and I knew that I had to keep going and I couldn't quit. Um, usually in these races, um, to quit means that you have to have somebody come pull you out and there was no way to access this. There were no roads. And so if I were to stop, I would have stopped everybody behind me. And I felt that I owed it to everybody around me to keep going, to keep them safe, because if I stumbled and fell, so would they. So thinking about my one foot world, I kept going and it was long. I would say it was about a mile. And it might not seem like that much, but in mile seven, eight or nine in the middle of the night, all I could see was this circle. And I could see feet just behind, just in front of me. And I just kept going. And I've never hiked so fast or so far for so long. I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20. But I gave that everything that I had to get to the top of the ridge line. So one foot in front of the other. During the entire time, I never stopped thinking about Kong, that obstacle at the end. I just kept going and kept going. Whew, had to be ready. So cool thing is, is at the top of the ridge line, I watched the sunrise as I descended. So I watched the sunrise, I descended, and I watched Kong a mile all the way down the ridge line. Well, it turns out that at the very last minute, I did not attempt Kong. There were several reasons why I didn't, and I've gone back and tried it since then. But it wasn't about the obstacle at the end. It was about keeping going. So, hey, Eric, real quick, can we do a check on time? I just want to make sure before I get into the next piece and make sure I wrap up. How much time do we have left? Oh, we're we're good. Um, we can go for another about 10 minutes or so. 10 minutes, perfect. So the thing that I learned when I did this race was when life gets tough, um, Sometimes it's too big to look at tomorrow. Sometimes it's too big to look at next week or next year. But when you're focusing on that one foot world and it's okay to be in that one foot world, do what you can in that moment because every step counts. Stopping is not an option, guys. We got to keep going. And our world is in a really weird place right now. Don't lose sight of where you're going, even in the dark. And know that, guys, you signed up for this and it will be worth it. Um, it's also okay to save some obstacles to come back for later. So I wanted to share a little bit with you about my one foot world because this is kind of where we all are. This is sort of like where America is right now. We are stuck. We feel like we're just in this holding pattern of what is our world going to be and it's changing on us every day. And if we can sit here in our one foot world and think about our impact, the reality is we can't help but impact those around us and what we do matters. Even when we're sitting here, I'm 4,000 miles away um, here meeting with people that I've never met with before. What we do matters and we owe it to our children to leave the world better than we found it. So with that being said, we're gonna move into the second piece of this. And that is my hope in sharing something valuable with people out there is that you're able to take something here and apply it to your lives. And I'll know that I was successful today if you walk away thinking and wondering and wondering what our world could be next. Our world doesn't have to be screens. Our world doesn't have to be classrooms with 30 children and one teacher. We can do this better and we owe it to our children to figure out how. So that being said, uh, we're gonna talk about um, the one thing that most of us have in common is that we either have parents, siblings, or children, or we have family, whether they are blood or um, adopted. And I do have a lot of adoptive family. And so I want to acknowledge your responsibility as a role model. It's a big responsibility. And every single day, that is the most important work that you could be doing. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my girls. And as a parent, I'm hoping that you'll keep this parent lens on, on what is equity for our kids and what do our kids deserve? Because I think that the way that education is, it works for very few. 
and most of us just suffer through it and hopefully we, we get out of it okay. So, uh, my girls, <laughs> here we are. So I don't have my own children, uh, but what I wanted to do is uh, just share a little bit about Misha and Callie. So there's, there's often this stigma about um, people um, not having children and a lot of people feel bad for me about that. And I did make a choice and it's a heavy choice to choose to have children. Uh, that to me is the most important job on the whole, on the whole planet. And you are your parents' first teachers. And if you're an auntie or you're an uncle or you know you have influence on any children's life, um, you fall into this category too. So when we adopted Callie, um, everything was unknown and we just had such high hopes for her. We didn't know she was gonna have problems until much later. So when we adopted Misha, um, we knew her family history. We met our parents. Um, we just, we didn't know what we were getting into with her until she was um, eight months old. So I'm going to just change my speaker view just a little bit here because I want to make sure that you all can see, um, see all of this. Okay, so um, I'm just going to share a couple little things here. Uh, I, I had a story where I was uh, talking with a teacher and um, I, I was saying to this um, teacher, I was like, ah, she, she just gets too hot outside. It's because she's black. She absorbs so much heat, I can't leave her outside very long. And I hear in the background, miss, can't say that, that's racist. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I turned and I was like, hmm, what is that? Well, I, I was so caught off guard. Here's another little story uh, about Callie. Um, every time my father, I love my father, and every time he calls me, he asks, and how are your girls? Misha and, oh, what's the black one's name? Oh, that's right, Callie. And my response every time is stable, no change. They're healthy and mobile and they're in good spirits. But we brace. We know that they won't live that long and we want to enjoy their health as long as we can before they get injured or their condition deteriorates. We brace, um, we brace. So equal is not fair and fair is not equal. I learned that the hard way with my girls. Um, they both require very, very different things. Uh, on the surface, they seem the same. They, they look, they, I mean, you could almost not even tell the difference if you just look on paper. They're the same height, they're the similar weight. They're about 11 months apart. Right now, they're seven and a half and eight and a half. They have a similar energy level. They're both really sensitive. Oh my gosh, they're so sensitive. And they don't know their size or their strength. They both um, respond to up to about 25 words of vocabulary. They are kind, loving, protective, cooperative, and lazy. Yet they are very different. Callie is affectionate and cuddly. Misha is playful and antagonistic. She is quite a trip. She's very stubborn and bossy and curious, where Callie is excitable, responsive, yet very timid. Callie is really needy. Misha is really independent. So I constantly feel like I'm playing favorites. Misha gets to eat whenever she wants to because she's really skinny and she has a really sensitive stomach. Um, but Misha also doesn't get to join us on very many adventures. So Callie does get to come with me. Well, she used to get to come with me on more adventures um, until she blew out her knee. So I just want to take a moment and let you think, um, those of you who are listening, have you experienced equity dilemmas in your house? Whew, equity dilemmas. I imagine most parents have. And then you wanna throw on top of that the medical needs. Medical needs add up, oh my gosh. So here are my girls. This is your first exposure to Misha and Callie. Let's see if you can tell which one's which. Uh, they are the most incredible, incredible beasts on the planet. Uh, they, uh, because of their injuries, they don't get to come with us very often. And so getting them to Alaska was uh, a seven day, about 15 hours average day to drive, to get them in and out of the car every time they require assistance. And so, um, there they are, just uh, chilling out in the car. Oh boy, so we had to up our game when it came to behavior because they just have really unpredictable behavior. And um, we didn't learn until Misha was much older that she, she tries to, she kind of goes red and she like attacks other dogs. And so we had to learn uh, how to uh, handle a St. Bernard. And I'll tell you that um, I do not take lightly St. Bernard's because man, her will is stronger than mine every day. And I have to constantly be that parent, that who mom dog parent that 
I, I didn't ever think I would have to be. So um, most recently, and this is not her sitting in my car, but my husband went ahead and took her, um, he borrowed my car and he took both dogs. And next thing I know, um, my whole front seat is covered in St. Bernard fur. And that's just how we roll here, I guess. So confessions, guys, I hate to be the bad guy. I hate to be so directive and constantly have to be so assertive with them. And it's a lot like being a classroom teacher, you can't budge. Because if you do, then you've already sort of lost um, and you can't get to the learning. But my girls will constantly challenge me. So uh, I'm going to skip past some of the, the sad parts here. We're going to skip to the really exciting parts about Misha and Callie. So there's Callie. <laughs> All right. That's Callie is a puppy. That's Misha. That's, that's Callie with her first um, little injury, not a serious one. And there's Misha. I just wanted to share a little bit with you guys because I knew that my niece might be watching. Hi, Bianca. <laughs> so um, we're not going to try videos today, um, but here's Misha. Um, she has a, a luxating patella. It moves. It's hard to find sometimes. So this was our first attempt at treatment. Our best treatment is just prevention right now. There's Callie after her uh, first uh, knee injury. So uh, that was three months of escorting my little puppy outside with a towel under her and helping her get outside so that she could go potty um, in the middle of winter uh, back in Colorado. So there they are, my girls again. So what I wanted to do is just share with you a little bit about Misha and Callie <clears throat> because as parents, those of you who are in this situation where you are now the primary parent and educator of your child. Uh, we don't have a school to take our kids and many of us are even struggling with childcare. I can't even begin to understand what parents have to do to be able to be equitable, be fair, be loving, be kind. I, the reality is I choose to take on the responsibility of caring for my girls. I love them more than ever but I'm not a parent. And also, I'm not really a who mom either. Like, um, I have two sisters who are very much who moms and they are parents for their dogs. I am not. My dogs are, um, they are my pets. Um, and with that being said, I just want you to know how humbly I come with um, any messages to you today because I don't have my own children. And every day I feel the pressure of how can I possibly help support all of my nieces and my nephews and children out there who who need a different learning experience and so with education being in this weird state of flux what i really want to do is encourage everybody here to think a little bit about what education could be if you got to envision it i didn't talk much about my job but one of the things that i get the privilege of doing is actually designing from birth through adulthood, an entire education system, meaning we get to redefine what education could be. And what I hope is that every one of you out there is saying, well, gosh, okay, well, what, it, what could it be? What should it be? If we're gonna limit our screen time to, you know, maybe perhaps not even exposing our infants and our toddlers, but waiting until they're preschool, if we're gonna change how we're interacting with our children with education, we have an opportunity to innovate and do something like we've never done before. And so even the privilege of getting to join you here today from 4,000 miles away, it makes me wonder what we could do if we all put our, our hearts, our souls, and our minds together and focus on that positive impact that we can have. I do believe that universal education should be free, should be available to everybody. Uh, I know that's not very uh, doable at the moment, but uh, let's be innovative and let's think about it. How do we get the right education to everybody? So with that, I'm gonna figure out how to stop sharing that screen there for a second and uh, say thank you for your time. Uh, I hope that I was able to uh, add something valuable to the conversation and uh, I think that's, that's about it. I think we're at questions now, Eric. 